Hey, what's up everyone? Today's video, I'm taking a slightly different approach to it. The focus for today is how to improve through condition games. And now the focus for this video is going to be more coaching based than anything else. I'm not analyzing the best of the best of the best in the world, but I'm analyzing pretty decent players. And I'm not saying that for myself. The two players on the screen are yours truly on the left and a good friend of mine and a former student named George Crown. So the focus of the video is to really show you guys how you can work on your tactics, your technique, and start to raise your awareness about different things through condition games. Now, if you like the video, make sure you give it a thumbs up, leave a comment, subscribe to the channel. Based on the feedback that I receive, I might actually create a series of such videos because I can easily record some of the training sessions and the coaching sessions that I do with some of the top juniors and some of the higher level players that I do coach and I can then break it down. And I'm, I'm going to be uh, putting myself on the spot and I'm going to show you areas where I mess up and from a technical perspective and a tactical perspective. So I think you might enjoy this. And George is a great player. He goes to Harvard. He plays under legendary coach Mike Way over there. He's a former Canadian uh, national junior champion. So, you know, you're, you're watching a pretty good standard of squash, but you're going to see far more errors and, and opportunities for improvement when you watch us play compared to the best of the best and the top pros because they don't make the same errors nearly as frequently as we do. So now I want this video to be extremely valuable and educational for you. So this is what we're doing. I want to give you guys a template or a way to think about how you actually structure your sessions and how you think about extracting the maximal value out of your own training. So first of all, what are condition games? What are different types of drills and things you can do? Well, you could be doing solo hitting, but you got to have a focus and design a drill. And we're going to talk about everything you see on your screen in a minute. You could be doing pattern drills. That's where you hit the same shot over and over with a partner. So there isn't that much thought involved around reading the game. It's more about executing and being technically proficient. And then there are condition games where there's more variety. You have certain shots that you can hit and you're playing with purpose, not just with technique, but also tactics and shot selection. And then obviously you have progressions to condition games where you have more and more conditions that could uh, essentially open up into a full court game. So the best way to think about setting up a condition game is to first select a focus. And what you're going to see in today's video is a length only condition game. And the focus here was to try to squeeze our opponent in the back corner, keep the ball tight to the wall, deep in the back, push up on the tee, look to volley and apply pressure. We were playing where we could hit the second bounce just behind the short line. So that's right in the line on the floor where the service box is. That's a short line. You could play second bounce there. And the reason for that is because if we play first bounce behind the short line, then people have a tendency to cheat and hang back on the tee. But we want to promote volleying. We want to promote movement off the ball effectively. We want to promote tight hitting and then rewarding ourselves. Uh, it also gives you some options with angles and things like that. So step one, select a focus. Step two, design a drill. So if our focus was to work on length hitting, so targets, technique, movement, tactics, whatever it might be, the drill could be a length game with second bounce behind the short line. You can design any sort of drill to work on whatever your focus is. And if you like this video, please leave the comment because then I can show you different progressions and different types of condition games through future videos. You got to focus on targets. So in the length game, we have an idea in our mind that we want the ball to take its first bounce in the second half of the service box or behind, depending on how high or how low you hit it. And the second bounce is near the back of the court. So it's fading into the back corner, not rising. Um, that's for the straight drive. For the cross court, you have an appropriate target. If your opponent is volleying a lot, your target shifts. It needs to be wider. So those are all the sorts of things you got to think about. We can work on our awareness when it comes to condition games. So a length game is great to build the awareness to say, is my opponent hanging back? Well, then I might hit that shorter length where the second bounce is near the short line. Is my opponent cheating over to the left when we're playing down the left-hand side wall? Well, then I'm going to hit a nice wide cross that pins them in the back and hopefully force a boast out of them. 
So it's the awareness you want to start developing of where your opponent is when you have limited shot options because you don't have to worry about the entire court. And then obviously the last piece is focus on shot selection, which is based on the awareness that you're building, based on the targets that you're putting out and whatever your focus is. So it's sort of an iterative process and you can think about all of these factors. Now the other thing to think about, and you see in the notes at the bottom of the left of the screen, is that you gotta think about appropriate progressions and regressions. So if a length game with the second bounce at the short line is too advanced because maybe you're older and you're not, you know, you don't want to be to making hard lunges, for example, or you just need to really focus on getting that ball into those back corners and you don't even need another focus to distract you, well then make the first bounce behind the short line. So that would be regressing the drill a little bit because then you're only focused on those back corners. Whereas you could progress that drill and what George and I uh, do as well sometimes is if we force a really loose ball from the opponent because we've hit a really tight length or we've hit a really good length and width so the only thing to have is a boast, well then we can try to do anything off of that boast that we've earned to try to win the point. It could be a drop, a kill, uh, boast, a uh, trickle boast, whatever it is. So those are ways to progress and regress your drills. And then you always have to have a purpose and a focus when you're training because without that you're totally moving away from what the researcher Anders Ericsson coined deliberate practice and that's what the best in the world do in order to raise their games optimally and there's a whole kind of process behind that it's very simple but there's a process if you want to know about that leave a comment in the comment section please and then the last thing I would encourage you to think about depending on your level you really want to just focus on one element at a time so if you're a beginner first bounce if you're using this example of a length game that i'm going to show you first bounce needs to be behind the short line so everything's deep and you're focusing on one thing maybe you're just focusing on rotating as you move off the tee maybe you're focusing on extending your follow-through maybe you're focusing on finishing your swing and pushing back to the tee whatever your focus is focus on one thing ideally build all of that in solo then in pattern drills where you know where the ball is going and then condition games are the third layer of that. So focus on one element at a time. If you're very advanced, then you gotta think about more than one piece at a time, or what would have happened by this point is that you would have ingrained all of the previous layers of, the th of things. So for example, everything I just talked about, you already rotate and get your racket back as you move off the tee, you turn your hips, your shoulders, you finish your foot footing and your stepping is correct. You finish your swing and you push back to the tee. If all those things are correct, well then your focus might shift to certain tactics or it might shift to using height or varying pace, whatever it is, but you have to be strategic based on your current level. So everything you see on your screen right now is a detailed visual representation of everything I talked about. So take a minute and review this when you have a second. Essentially, like I mentioned, your focus, it could be, are you focused on technique, targets, accuracy? Is it tactical? Is it movement? Is it patience? Is it focus? Is it mental? Is it all of the above? So think about your focus, select one if you're a beginner player, select more if you're an advanced player. Then we talk about designing the drill. I talked about this already. Focus on your targets so that you can force a loose ball and then try to win the rally off of the loose ball that you force so that you're building good habits. So it's using that one-two punch combo, for example. Awareness is key. So when you're playing, you got to ask yourself questions. If something didn't pan out or you weren't able to execute things the way you needed to or wanted to or hoped to, you have to ask yourself what happened. Now, this is tricky because if you're a beginner, you won't know what you're doing incorrectly. And that's where a coach is really, really important. The coach can see the subtleties because they know more. They can see the things that you're doing incorrectly. And I'm going to put a plug in for myself. I do a lot of video analysis for a lot of people and I've been doing a lot of virtual sessions in addition to the on-court sessions. People are finding a ton of value in it. So if you want a coach's perspective, if you want my perspective, send me an email. It's ahad at arproformance.com. I'll put it up over here on your screen. Send me an email. Let's chat about getting a video analysis for you. And I create this report with all of the different things that you guys can work on with drill suggestions, with solo suggestions, et cetera, et cetera. Send me an email. I'll get you all that information. Because the key is after the coach can guide you on how to do things appropriately, now you're creating an effective, accurate blueprint in your mind. And once you have the blueprint in your mind, then you can self-correct. But if you don't have the 
accurate blueprint in your mind, you can never self-correct because you don't know what to do. So I've talked a lot. Let's jump into some of the clips. I hope that the previous information was really, really valuable. Watch it again, listen to it again. It gives you a really, really good way of thinking about things when you're structuring your own training. So let's jump into the clips. George is in blue, I'm in red. I just hit that drive from the back. I'm gonna break down a little technical error I made over there. George is staying on the volley. I'm trying to get him behind me. It's good defending by George. Did a good job over there as well. I hit a cross at the wrong time. Not able to get the ball behind George. His is a bit short as well. Here we go, just getting back into the rallying position. loose cross his is a little bit loose and short and that's a let from this angle it's tough to say whether it's a letter or a stroke but yeah it might have been a stroke from this angle it looked like a stroke I think it was a let that we played let's jump into a little technical analysis so you notice if you notice in the rally earlier when I was playing a backhand volley one of my backhand volley drives were really short that's the one on the left and actually I'll show you a couple of other things and the one on the right, the clip you see on the right, is when I executed the backhand volley drive more effectively. I'm going to break down what made the difference, but before we even get there, let me show you guys some more details. So the first thing you see is there's a split step. So if I go back a little bit, you see right when George has hit the ball, right when he's hitting, little hop with my feet, and then because I know the ball is going to the left, the right foot plants in both clips and then I move over now over here you're gonna notice the hips the feet the shoulders are all starting to rotate and move towards the side wall and you're gonna notice them more see especially the clip on the right everything's turned the clip on the left things have turned as well you wanna step in but one mistake I made on the clip on the left is that I stepped and I stopped, so I broke my momentum. And then I needed to regenerate power. Whereas the clip on the left, I stepped and I hit as soon as I stepped. So that's a critical thing, a technical error that a lot of people make. And then the clip on the left, I didn't really rotate my shoulders very much. The clip on the right, you see my shoulders are rotated further back. That, allow, that rotation allows you to then come through the ball. So you notice the clip on the left, minimal shoulder rotation, already planted. The clip on the right, planting, good rotation. And check it out. The clip on the left, my follow through came down. I kind of whipped my racket down instead of actually coming through the ball. And you'll see the clip on the right now. I came through the ball and then I continued my racket swing. The other thing I did on the clip on the left is I opened up my body. I think I was a little bit unsure about, do I want to hit straight? Do I want to go across? What do I want to do? And then breaking my momentum by planting resulted in this. I opened my body because I didn't rotate my shoulders back enough. Whereas the clip on the right, I rotated my shoulders and then my body doesn't open. My racket follows through and the ball goes through the court. I also used more height on the clip on the right. The clip on the left, I went a little bit lower and you see the difference. The clip on the left, the ball is loose and short. The clip on the right, the ball is tight and going deep. And you see the difference over here is also in terms of movement. The clip on the left, I hit a poor shot, so I have to get back to the tee faster in order to cover the next shot that George hits. And the clip on the right, I can take my time getting back to the tee because it's tight, it's high, I have more time to get back to the tee because I'm experiencing less pressure. So another little coaching tip, depending on the quality of your shot, the speed of your shot, the direction of your shot, whether your opponent is going to volley or not, all of those things dictate how quickly you need to move back to the tee after playing your own shot. Now, the reason I find these videos and I want to start doing more of these if you guys want to see more of these is because People at our level make these kind of mistakes more often than the top players in the world do. It's really hard to see the top players in the world making technical errors like I just did. 
I might make this kind of an error one out of 10 times, or maybe two out of 10 times, the top players in the world make them maybe one out of 50 times, or one out of 100 times. So it's rare to find them there. <laughs> I'm happy to put myself out, and you guys can learn through my mistakes as well. So let's jump into the next rally. So here I defend when George is putting a bit of pressure on me, using moderate height there, setting up the rallies, trying to get in front of each other. I tried playing a shorter kill. I got that volley. And George is staying in front of me, I'm trying to use height and direction, changing direction to get in front of him. And there is his kill. So see, here's an analysis. So I'm gonna point out a few things for you guys of that rally. So see the first one, I'm not super stretched out and under pressure, but I gave a slightly loose body serve. So he put me under moderate pressure. I decided to just reset that by lifting. I didn't lift high enough and he volleyed it. He's also a big guy. I think he's 6'1 or 6'2 and he went across my body. See, my momentum was going to the left. He went across my body. I have to reset my left foot to move back to the right side. I'm in the back right corner. I managed to get the ball back and now we're kind of in that reset jockeying for position mode. Now over here, I attempted my cross variation uh, but and I attempted the kill but it was a little bit too loose. So now I volley to avoid getting pinned in that back right corner. And I'll check out my swing over here. So I play this ball but see I stop my swing again. I'm not following through. So the ball's a little bit loose and he's hunting and volleying. And over here I'm stuck, so I want to change the angle, direction and height. And I get that ball higher and past him. He still volleys, but it's behind. And now over here, because he's volleying so much, I went wider on my cross, but he stayed a little further back. And that wide cross actually means that the ball pops right out into the middle of the court. And he has the tee, so now I have to work around him again. He sends me back into the corner I just came from and I'm stuck defending again. This time my defense was loose. He steps up, plays a shorter kill, and his kill stays in front of me. Kind of probably just wanted that rally to end. <laughs> okay, let's move on to the next rally. I tried to get a body line serve just for variation. We're both jockeying up and down for position. Getting that ball moderately tight. He hits a loose one. I hit that kill. So let me just show you that one again. So we're here, he hits that loose ball when I had him under pressure, and then I he's stuck kind of beside and behind me, so I play a shorter kill where the ball kind of dies in front. He's expecting it to go back a bit. He could have probably gotten that, but I think he was annoyed with his own shot, so he didn't. Let's jump into the next rally. So here was my attempt at a squeeze. So I played that shorter drive kill, setting it up, squeeze him, he pops a loose ball, and then I'm hunting that ball to get in front of him. I played a good cross, he's stuck digging it out into the back. He plays it a bit loose, I jump on the volley again. I mostly had been hitting cross, so I decided to volley straight to apply pressure on him, and he's there stretching out, he pops another loose one up, and then I play to the other side, not deep enough, but I'm staying hunting because his ball wasn't tight enough. And see, actually there, George did exactly what I did in the previous rally. See, I'm extending through and look at his swing. See, now he swung down and his ball was too low and it stayed short, which allowed me to jump on it again. So I'm trying to be relentless with my pressure. I tried to change the angle, but it sat up a little bit too much. He wanted to probably end the rally there so he tried to play a kill but it wasn't tight enough and that resulted in the stroke in my favor moving on to the next rally so here George and I are again using some width trying to beat each other I use the close kill squeeze it stays a bit short George defends but it's a bit loose here I'm trying to stay volley volleying in front of him but then I respect and reset when he hits a good enough length and now we're back into the jockeying for position mode. Trying to stay on the volley. 
good defense by him. And back here, he hit a little funny bounce, so I got in trouble. And I, he squeezed me on that length, and I hit that ball out. Now you're gonna see in this rally that Unfortunately, I'm unable to get my length deep and tight enough. And oftentimes I'm hitting a little bit too low and when I hit my crosses, they're not getting deep enough. And as a result, I'm constantly under pressure. So let's check this out. I get that, George is cutting it off at three quarter and I'm going to the back. Send him back once. He's at three quarter, I'm in the back. He's at three quarter, I'm in the back. He wasn't able to hit through the court enough that time. I'm trying to defend. And lucky for me, right there, he hits the tin. That was the right shot for him to try to put that away. But now there are a few factors that we can think about. You can say my constant retrieval and him being unable to finish the point sooner may have caused a little bit of mental anguish. Maybe, maybe he tried to force the ball to hit the winner because I was retrieving some shots. Could have hit the tin for that reason. The higher you go, that becomes less and less likely. The higher you go in levels, that becomes less and less likely because the mental toughness and focus is there and the execution is more consistent from a technical perspective, etc. The other side of it is that, and I pointed this out in my last video with Rami Ashur and I'll link to it over here for you, is that you could be playing subpar squash, but you still have to go after the ball and do your best and get it and try to make adjustments to the best of your ability by becoming aware. In that rally, I did not become aware early enough and I didn't try changing the pace and the angles enough to get him behind me. So even though you're not playing your best, you could still come out on top of the rally, but it's not sustainable over the long run. You have to make some kind of adjustment. Unless you are significantly fitter than your opponent, which could happen at a lower level, but does not happen at a higher level, unless you're gonna be able to run twice as much as them and still wear them down, unlikely you're gonna win if you're playing the way I just played in that rally. Now, the other side of it is that if you are George in this example, he would be positive and he would be optimistic even though he hit that tin if he had a powerful mindset, which he generally does. Because even though he lost that rally, he had me under pressure. He was realizing, hey, I'm on the tee a lot more than Ahad is on the tee. And that means that eight out of 10 times, he's gonna come out ahead in a rally like that. And that's obviously those are percentages and odds that do not work in my favor. So I have to make an adjustment. Okay, let's jump in to the next rally from here. So I'm there. There was a squeeze by me, actually. So let's check this one out in slow-mo because there are a couple of things to point out. Nice high serve. I have to volley it, but watch my follow-through here. See the follow-through short, and I'm not extending my racket's line. As a result, the ball catches a sidewall, bounces a bit short. George is cutting it off at three-quarter length. I'm getting into the back corner and then watch me extend my follow through that time and the ball comes through the court without catching the sidewall he still cuts it off but my ball is glued and i squeezed him and remember we're playing length of the second bounce behind the short line his ball is short in a real game in a full game if i played that squeezing length and then he popped up that short ball well i get to attack it and just for fun i went and i practiced going and hitting the cross court drop so there you go, folks. I hope that this video was really, really helpful by providing you structure about how you think about setting up condition games and tactical skill development. I hope that you also notice some of the technical elements, some of the things that I am also inconsistent with and truly players from at all levels aren't always consistent, but the better you get, the more consistent you become naturally. So things like rotating enough, things like extending that follow through. Even when you're under pressure and you have to hit that ball a bit behind you, you still have to kind of snap and extend that follow through a little bit. You know, little things like that. There's obviously the timing of the split step, the movement. I mean, there are infinite details we could talk about, but the goal of this video was to give you guys a flavor of using myself and some of the, the athletes that I coach and show you guys not just how to approach it from a structure standpoint, but the technique and the tactics. If you found value in this, as always, please give it a thumbs up. Please subscribe to the channel. Please share a comment and let me know what you think. If you want your own videos analyzed, 
if you would like me to be <laughs> as critical with you as I am with myself, I'd love to do it. Truthfully, just by watching a few of my videos, because I haven't analyzed my own games in a long time, but by watching myself, I played uh, and we did have this session with George last Friday, so a few days ago. And then I got on court with another one uh, of my higher level students. And even though my focus is on him, when we got into sparring mode after our lesson time finished, well, then I started thinking about some of the things that I was working on. And I noticed myself saying, okay, get your racket up a little bit earlier. Make sure you rotate on that volley. Make sure you follow through consistently and effectively. So, you know, no matter what your level is by getting a video analysis or doing your own video analysis, if you have that internal blueprint created, it's going to make a drastic improvement to your game. Folks, leave a comment. I look forward to hearing from you. And if you want more of these, I'm happy to provide them. All right. Have a good one, guys, and I'll see you in the next video.